In this demonstration, I'm going to show you how to construct 2D Brillian Zones and hopefully achieve a better understanding of them and what they are. So, a Brillian Zone is an important concept in material science and solid-state physics alike because it is used to describe the behavior of an electron in a perfect crystal system. So, what is a Brillian Zone? The Brillian Zone is a particular choice of the unit cell of the reciprocal lattice. It is defined as the Wigner side cell of the reciprocal lattice. It is constructed as a, the set of points enclosed by the Bragg planes. The planes perpendicular to a connection line from the origin of, to each lattice point passing through the midpoint. Alternatively, it is defined as the set of points closer to the origin than to any other reciprocal lattice point. The whole reciprocal space may be covered without overlap with copies of such a brilliant zone. Okay, so that was a rather convoluted definition. Let's do it again, but to brush up and be sure that we understand this definition, we're going to define the reciprocal space and the Bragg planes as well. To define both of these, we'll also do a quick revision of what is the erect lattice, so that we can go from there to the reciprocal lattice. <clears throat> The macroscopic perfect crystal is formed by adding identical building blocks, so to say unit cells, consisting of atoms and groups of atoms. A unit cell is the smallest component of a crystal that, when stacked together with pure translational repetition, reproduces the whole crystal, which essentially means that you could take the same thing over and over and over again and get the whole system done. So yeah, the groups of atoms, these unit cells that form the macroscopic crystal by infinite repetition is called the basis. Okay, that seems quite clear. And the basis is formed in such a way that it forms the lattice, more commonly known as the Brevet lattice. Every point of a Brevet lattice is equivalent to every other point, which means that the arrangement atoms in the crystal is the same when viewed from different lattice points. Okay, that also seems quite understandable and you should probably know that by now. So any fundamental lattice must be definable by three primitive translational vectors A1, A2 and A3. The combination of these vectors is used to define the crystal translational vector R such that R is equal to A1 N1 plus A2 N2 plus A3 N3 where N are just arbitrary integers to show the mark which show the size of our lattice. So when we <clears throat> the crystal lattice is repeated an infinite amount of times to create the perfect crystal structure and each of those lattices are translationally symmetric and the way I look at this is that one cannot tell their positional in crystal structure because every lattice looks the same okay so now okay so that seems to make sense so now let's go through reciprocal space Okay, so every lattice has a reciprocal lattice associated to it. In crystallography terms, the reciprocal lattice is the diffraction pattern of a crystal, or in quantum mechanics it's described as k-space, with k being for k wave vectors. In 3D lattice, the vectors would be b1, b2, and b3, and they can be denoted as, we'll look at just b1, b1 is equal to 2 pi times the cross product of vectors a2 and a3 from our direct lattice, divided by the triple scalar product of a1, a2, and a3, in which case this cross product of a2 and a3 is the area of our vector, of our two vectors, and the triple scalar product is the volume of our system. By simplifying it, we can just get 2 pi over the height of our unit cell. Or we can put it in this way, the larger our direct lattice gets, the smaller in comparison our reciprocal lattice becomes. Another observation that could actually be made by the reciprocal lattice is that the reciprocal lattice of the reciprocal lattice is the direct lattice. But okay, for simplicity's sake, let's look at a transformation from 2D lattice to a reciprocal lattice. Okay, so we have a visualization here where we can change the length of our x vector in direct space and the length of our y vector in direct space. And we can change whether or not we're seeing this as a direct lattice or by pressing this button as a reciprocal lattice. So as we can see by increasing the length of our direct, direct vector, we change the sizes of our reciprocal lattice vectors and the other way around. Okay, so now we had a definition of the reciprocal space and direct space. Let's go back to our definition. 
So the first Boolean zone can be defined as a set of points in reciprocal space that can be reached from a specific point of origin without crossing any Bragg planes. Okay, so what are Bragg planes? A Bragg plane, or in this case a Bragg line, is a Bragg line with which perpendicularly bisects a reciprocal lattice vector, a vector which connects two lattice points. And the closest Bragg planes are essentially a closing the Brillian zone. Now we can show the Bragg planes for the closest neighbors, with this being our original lattice point. And these are the four closest neighbors in a simple, I'd say cubic, but it's actually just a square lattice because it's in 2D. And if we add the second lattice vectors for the second closest neighbors, you can see these ones, and it essentially conveys the same information. But when we go to a higher order of of closest neighbors, we can see that the system gets a lot more complex. Okay, so now we've seen what our black planes we can go towards brilliant zones. So this is the first brilliant zone. It is what it seems it is. As you can imagine the black planes just go here. And the brilliant zone shows us the area and reciprocal space that is closer to our lattice point than any other lattice point, which are essentially the black planes as well. As we can see, if our reciprocal lattice origin point is in here, this, the square is closer to this point than to any other point, and after these lines it gets the other way around. So we can move on forward to a higher order of brilliant zones. <clears throat> and this is the brilliant zone for the second closest neighbor. As you can see, it, it is rather similar, it just takes the second closest neighbors and essentially draws another square, but it's a bit uh, tilted to the edge. Okay, so now let's look at the third one. For the third brilliant zone, it gets a bit more complex because if we scroll a bit backwards, we can see that the third bra the Bragg planes for the third closest neighbors are these ones. So we might think that this whole thing would be the brilliant, the third brilliant zone, but it's actually not because with every next system, it gets a bit more complex, and it's actually taking account both the third Bragg planes and the first ones. Okay, so now let's do another thing. Let's turn off on that we can see all the Bragg planes and turn it up another notch. Okay, so here we can see that the fourth brilliant zone gets a lot more complex. And we can see all the Bragg planes for the quite for the closest neighbors. And these lines quite get quite difficult to understand by drawing themselves, but we can help ourselves out with this visualization. So yeah, we can see that they start to interact with each other and thus make a more difficult structure. And if we go to the fifth one and see, show that we can see all the brilliant zones. Okay, so here we can see that it gets becomes quite a nice drawing. If we, we were to keep adding them, I mean, let's just do it. Let's add it to the ninth one. Okay, so see here we can see a high order of brilliant zones and it actually looks kind of nice, which is also interesting because it's also an art form drawing high the drawing high order brilliant zones and with the higher you go the more complex and more discrete the system gets and it essentially looks nicer okay so after looking at this we can get a sh short definition of how to construct 2d brilliant zones so nth brilliant zone can be defined as the area or volume if we look in 3d in reciprocal space that can be reached from the origin by crossing exactly n minus one brag planes okay so we can look also at a brilliant zone for a system where the atoms are not perfectly in a perfect square lattice, but are offset a bit, making, so to say, a triangular lattice. And as we can see here, the first brilliant zone is a, such, such a hexagon, and the second one already gets a bit more difficult by forming a star shape, and the third one is, again, so to say, a hexagon, and it goes on like that. Okay, so in the end, so what information does the brilliant zone hold and what does it give us? In short, vectors in the brilliant zone or on its boundary characterize states in a system with lattice period periodicity. For example, phonon or, or electron states. But for that, the whole of the video. Nah. And this code for this demonstration was taken and edited from Mathematica demonstration, shunts made by Yaroslav Kloss.